five interesting shows this week to tackle sort of all over the map. We've got a new Marvel adult animated series. We've got another Ryan Murphy and Netflix collaboration. We've got a monologue type show uh, of an anthology sort. Uh, and we also have a couple of gay themed things as we head into Pride Month. Let's talk TV. Hey guys, Dan here. This is Dan Reviews. Welcome to TV News and Reviews for the week. We've got five new shows to tackle. Like I mentioned, we've got Modoc from uh, Marvel, Halston over on Netflix from Ryan Murphy, Solos on Amazon Prime, and uh, we have a new documentary series called Pride, all about uh, the, the gay rights activism from the 50s to today, and then also a new uh, talk show of sorts on HBO Max, uh, headed up by black lesbian Sam J. So we're going to talk about all of these shows. But first up, of course, it is TV news. Uh, and last week, we sort of tackled a lot of the stuff of the upfronts from the major networks. Most of that, though, was about uh, new fall schedules and what shows got the axe at the last minute there. Um, so this week, we have uh, going in a little bit deeper with some of the other projects that were announced at the upfronts that we didn't quite get to talk about yet. But first up, a couple of renewals. We like to start there. Uh, Chad over on TBS has been renewed for season two. Entertainment Weekly just uh, had a, a nice write-up about that show for Emmy consideration. Um, I thought it was okay when I reviewed it, but I do like Nassim Pedrad, so uh, happy to see her coming back with a season two on that. And then um, this is an interesting one because I actually hadn't even heard of this, uh, but season one of this show is just wrapping its filming right now, but Amazon Prime has already renewed it for season two. I guess they've uh, liked what they've seen so far. Rosamund Pike is in a new show called Wheel of Time, um, and that is from Robert Jordan's novel series. I don't know much about it, but uh, I do like her. So I guess we'll see season one at some point maybe in the fall if they're wrapping production now, and then uh, already renewed for season two. So good news for everybody working on that show. Uh, so, all right, let's get to some of the upfront news. So NBC has a ton of uh, things to announce, mostly because of their new Peacock streaming service. And they're sort of, uh, you know, bridging a lot of the, the gaps between NBC and Peacock and sort of merging the two in some ways. Um, so first of all, when we talked about the fall season last year, yes, I talked about Mr. Mayor, I talked about Young Rock and Keenan, all those got renewals. However, none of them are going to be on in the fall. All of them are going to be mid-season replacements, which means this is the first fall season in over 50 years on NBC without a comedy show in their fall lineup. So that's uh, interesting. You know, I grew up on the comedy blocks of NBC. Monday nights, you had Alf and the Hogan family. Thursdays, of course, was Cosby Show, Family Ties, Cheers, Night Court, and then they expanded into the other nights of the week with Frasier and Mad About You and News Radio and everything. You know, a NBC has a lot of my favorite comedies of all time, so it's it's sort of sad uh, to see where they've, where they've gone. But, you know, a lot of their comedy projects are moving over to Peacock, AP Bio, Girls 5 Eva, so they still obviously have their eye on comedy, but uh, maybe just not for their broadcast network as much uh, as in the past. Also, The Voice, reality staple on NBC, moving to just one cycle this next year to avoid burnout, much like Dancing with the Stars did on ABC a couple of years ago. We've had two cycles of The Voice every season, except for maybe the first two seasons, I think, or maybe just the first season. But it's it's always been running, you know, one spring, one fall. So they're going to um, to do that just one time a year from now on, uh, or at least for now, so uh, they don't get burnout. Uh, they also have, speaking of sort of their reality slate, they have a bunch of shows coming um, in the next few months. Some of these may premiere this summer, some not till the fall, maybe some not till mid-season. But you've got uh, America's Got Talent Extreme, which is going to be the more sort of daredevil acts of AGT. Um, you've got American Song Contest, which is basically going to be Eurovision, but in the U.S. Um, and it's funny, you know, Eurovision's been around for so long, but I, I think until that Will Ferrell movie on Netflix, a lot of people uh, didn't really know much about it. I knew a little bit, but 
Um, but yeah, that, that uh, could be very interesting. Uh, the Wheel is returning. That is the game show with, I think it was Dak Shepard uh, hosting that. And then uh, they're bringing back Who Do You Think You Are, the uh, genealogy TV show uh, that was, I don't know when that went off the air, but uh, aired a few years back, you know, in the, in the mid-2000s, late-2000s, I guess. But that will be back as well. Uh, they're also going to have Annie Live. That is their, their new live stage show. It'll be actually their first stage show since Jesus Christ Superstar uh, in the live variety anyway, since, you know, that was in 2018. Last year they did have The Grinch, but that was pre-taped. Um, and so uh, NBC will, will sort of be the first back on with one of these live uh, musicals. You know, for a, for a couple of years, they were sort of all the rage, all, all the networks, I think except CBS, got their hands on uh, at least a couple of them. But uh, NBC, I think, was the first first in in the recent revival of those because i think sound of music with carrie underwood was the first one uh and that was nbc all right so uh, other news uh from peacock there's a bunch of stuff going on on peacock uh the joe exotic show that they're doing with kate mckinnon uh is going to air exclusively on peacock they were originally going to do a, a three network launch nbc usa and peacock but now it's going to be a peacock exclusive and then uh, a new demi lovato show unidentified in which uh the singer is going to investigate ufo phenomena i guess she's or they uh, sorry not binary now uh they're a big fan of, of ufo stuff i i didn't really know that but uh that's going to be a show if, if you're a demi fan uh paris hilton has a new show coming out paris in love it's a 13 episode series that will document um, the, the prep and uh, lead up to her wedding day. Uh, I, I couldn't care less about this. I didn't care about Paris when she was uber famous. I certainly don't care now. Um, and then uh, Jojo Siwa, her and her mother, Jessalyn Siwa, are uh, going to star in a Making the Band-esque type of, of series called the Siwa Dance Pop Revolution. Uh, it's going to feature talented kids in all these different performances and competitions to land a spot in some sort of pop group with uh, Jess Siwa as their manager and JoJo serving as their choreographer. Um, uh, you know, look, I, JoJo Siwa is whatever to me. Uh, I, I I found out about her the same week she was on, um, uh, what, what's it called, um, The Masked Singer, um, which, like, I had just heard of her, and then all of a sudden she was everywhere. Like, that week she was on Masked Singer, I saw, like, a bunch of pr merchandise for her stuff at target and at hot topic and i was like or not hot topic five below and i was like okay like i get it so I, this could be interesting i guess for for the siwa fans I, I don't know how i'll feel about it but uh you know if you're a jojo siwa head whatever they call you uh then then maybe you'll like that uh there's also ed helms doing a uh, true story which is a six episode story um and randall park also involved with this from wandavision um, and it was originally picked up for NBC, but we'll go over to Peacock. It's based on some Australian show, and basically it will feature people uh, recounting real-life true stories, you know, talking to Helms and Park, and then a star-studded cast of actors is going to reenact whatever whatever the, the story is. It sounds kind of funny, uh, you know, especially if they get some interesting uh, people to do it. And then uh, Jimmy Fallon has a bunch of new projects I want to talk about. So there's the Kids Tonight Show. That's going to be on Peacock, and it's basically a late-night talk show hosted by kids, and kids will be in charge of everything. It could be kind of cute, you know, and it will tape uh, right across the hall from Fallon's Tonight Show. Lauren Michaels will be uh, the executive producer in addition to Fallon for that one. You've got uh, Clash of the Cover Bands. This was going to air on E!, um, and that's going to feature two bands who work in a similar musical genre. Um, and it, it'll be like a different genre each week. You know, one week will be heavy metal, one week will be, you know, boy band, whatever. Um, and then they'll go head to head and see who delivers the better cover performance. Fallon uh, will produce that. Five More Sleeps Till Christmas is an animated holiday special based on a uh, children's book that Fallon wrote um, about, you know, a kid who's excited about the counting down the days till Santa comes. Um, and then Mama and Dada is uh, another preschool, or is another uh, based on Fallon book type of show. It's a preschool animated series um, based on his books. Your baby's first word will be Dada and everything is Mama. I guess those are two separate books. Um, and that's going to be produced by DreamWorks. Um, so a, a lot of NBC stuff. Um, and, and as we're sort of on NBC, this will segue into my, my new casting announcements section. 
Um, so Saturday Night Live had its season finale last week. Great episode. Anya Taylor-Joy uh, was the host. She was wonderful. Um, but no cast announcements have been made yet for the fall season. However, um, you can count on, I think, at least four major players leaving SNL based on the episode that we saw, based on uh, people's contracts being up, based on other projects that they're doing. Um, so Cecily Strong, I think, is definitely leaving. She did a big goodbye song as her Janine Pirro character. Um, so I think she's out. I also think Pete Davidson is out. And the only thing that makes me think that, other than his contract being up, because I think they signed for, it's either five years or six years. Everybody signs the same basic contract, and then Lorne Michaels can fire you before that. But basically, if he wants to keep you around, you're, you're around. But uh, Pete Davidson, at the end of the Weekend Update, kind of thanked everybody for watching him grow up and, and whatever. And so that seemed like kind of a goodbye. Uh, A.D. Bryant then and Kate McKinnon. A.D. Bryant was in almost every sketch this week. Um, and she's been doing other projects. She was gone for eight episodes or something at the beginning of the season anyway because she was filming season three of Shrill, which would have been filmed last year or over summer break, but because of COVID, that didn't happen, so Lauren Michaels let her do that. Um, I think he might produce that show anyway, but uh, even if not, he, he let her out of that. Um, so, you know, I think her just being in every sketch pretty much this week leads me to believe that maybe she's leaving, and uh, I think Kate McKinnon is, is definitely gone as well. Uh, and, and she wasn't in hardly any sketches, but she was almost in tears in the uh, opening because they were all talking about how tough the last year has been and da-da-da-da-da. She was talking about how these people are her family, and she started crying. And she was only in a pre-taped sketch and no other live sketches the rest of the show. And I personally think that's because she knew it was going to be her last show and she couldn't really emotionally handle being in sketches. So I, I think those four are definitely going to be gone come the fall we'll probably have announcements in august about that but that's just sort of my my two cents about that all right uh sticking with casting betty gilpin will star alongside julie roberts and sean penn in this watergate drama on stars called gaslit uh and dan stevens uh, is is casted as well he's replacing army hammer who's had a lot of very interesting issues on his end lately um, and this will tell the stories of some of the forgotten characters in uh, the, the Nixon scandal. Uh, Hulu has a couple as well. Jillian Anderson will be on The Great uh, in the new season as Catherine's mother in a recurring role. Love Jillian Anderson. I've actually been watching her lately in Hannibal. Uh, we've been doing Hannibal reviews here on this channel. And she plays uh, his therapist. She's great. She's always great. I've loved her ever since The X-Files. And then another one on, on Hulu with a person I really like, Kumail Nanjiani, is going to star in Immigrant, which is an eight-episode limited series based on uh, this the, the dude who started Chippendales, basically, uh, as a way to get people into uh, his Los Angeles bar that was not doing well. So that could be fun, too. And then um, on HBO Max, Sarah Ramirez, uh, who I know from Madam Secretary. She's done some other things, but she will join the Sex and the City reboot as its first non-binary character, uh, and, uh, you know, seems like a natural kind of fit, like New York obviously has pretty much every representation under the sun, uh, and yet this show was about uh, these four white ladies, so <laughs> I think it's great to get a little bit of diversity in uh, Sex and the City. And then for odds and ends, we've got uh, CW going to a full seven nights for the first time ever. If you didn't realize it, CW actually does not program on Saturdays, and up until a few years ago, they didn't program on Sundays either. Um, but basically, now that they have the CW Seed app and Warner Brothers owns both them and HBO Max, they are trying to, you know, sort of call more programming to sort of feed to their streamers. So it doesn't matter that nobody watches TV on Saturday nights. Um, but what I did learn is uh, last week when we were talking about their fall schedule, and I was like, Penn and Teller Fool Us wasn't on there, one of my shows, and Whose Line Is It Anyway wasn't on there. Well, they are now going to be part of the new CW Saturday, so you can enjoy that. Um, and as a sort of uh, give and take to their affiliates, they're going to return the 3 o'clock hour in the afternoons to their affiliates. They've been running reruns of Jerry Springer for years, um, and so that is uh, no more. Warner is going to start Front Row, which uh, is going to be another new streamer, but I I think it's going to be free, but it's going to host some originals from TNT, TBS, and HBO Max with commercials. 
um, including the flight attendant, Snowpiercer, and Claws among some of those shows. So, you know, could be an interesting way to get people sort of in the door to getting HBO Max. Obviously, not everything on there will be on this, but, you know, the flight attendant got a lot of buzz. So maybe people want to check it out, but they don't want to pay the, the $15 a month. That is one way to do that. Um, and then there's also going to be a five-night Harry Potter retrospective on HBO Max, TBS, and Cartoon Network, and that's going to include a, a quiz mini-series, like a four-night event series uh, with a game show format, and then a retrospective special. This is, I guess, the 20th anniversary of the first movie. Certainly not the books. They've been around way longer, but I think it's the 20th anniversary of the first movie, so uh, they're going to do that. And, and, and speaking of which, before we get to the reboots and spinoffs section, which will close up our news, I do want to mention this. I'm not going to do a full review of this, um, but I, I think this is a good place to talk about the Friends reunion that uh, HBO Max aired the other night. I watched it uh, right when it went up. I, I It was like 3.02 in the morning, and it had just gone up, and I watched it, and it was really, really enjoyable. Um, I, I love seeing everybody again. David Schwimmer looks exactly the same. Um, Matt LeBlanc remembers so many little details about different episodes and, and different things that happened on set. You know, mine like a like a steel trap, that one. Uh, and, and, and he really, uh, I, I thought was, you know, very, very happy to see everybody. Um, and, and they did a couple of reenactments of the scripts that I thought was great. They were like right on those, those old characters and they just, it was seamless. And then uh, I enjoyed some of the, uh, some of the guest stars they had. I, I, I would have liked to maybe see more guest stars or perhaps, uh, a little bit longer with the guest stars. Like we could have spent more time with Tom Selleck, for example, uh, than just kind of having him come in and say hello and asking a, a trivia question. Um, but they, they instead spent time giving us, you know, Mindy Kaling's reflections of friends and David Beckham's reflections of friends. And, and, and that's fine. Um, but like, you know, we all know we, we're fans, too. We watched them, you know, when, when they were on. I, I'd rather hear more from the people that were involved. I, and I love Mindy Kaling, but, you know, uh, that was sort of one of my negatives. But uh, overall, if you are a Friends fan, definitely check out the, uh, the reunion on HBO Max. I think... You will not be disappointed. I laughed. I cried. I uh, had some great memories in there. So not not a full review, but wanted to sort of uh, leave you guys with that, with the reunion. Okay, so reboots and spinoffs. We've got Netflix having Bridgerton, giving them a spinoff. Uh, it's a prequel about Queen Charlotte. Um, and Shonda Rhimes, who, of course, is, is very involved in Bridgerton, is going to uh, write the limited series. Um, so obviously the same actress won't be playing Queen Charlotte because it's a prequel. It's about her, you know, uh, life maybe before she was a, a royal or I, I don't know. I don't really know the story, but anyway, it's going to be, you know, set decades earlier than uh, the actual show over on Peacock, uh, more, more stuff with Peacock, but this stuff is, um, of the reboot and spinoff variety. So, uh, there's going to be a kid's version of American Ninja Warrior. There's a baking version of making it, uh, Below Deck has a new spinoff coming, and then there's a family edition of Top Chef. All of those heading to Peacock at some point uh, in the next year or so. Paramount Plus has a 10-episode revival of the uh, BET and CW show The Game. And uh, two of the original stars, uh, Wendy Raquel Robinson and uh, Jose Chantez, uh, will repeat, uh, reprise their roles. And they're the only people, by the way, who lasted all throughout the series. I think it was nine seasons on that show. CW had it for like three and then BET picked it up and it became, uh, what was it? The highest, uh, cable comedy premiere of all time or something. Um, and, uh, so other, other legacy cast members are expected to return to that. I never watched the game. However, I did watch girlfriends, which is the show it spun off from. So, um, I probably know maybe some of the characters on there, but, um, more from HBO max. We're going to revive project Greenlight. Uh, the, the movie sort of uh, reality show, I guess, where you're making a movie and you pitch it. And uh, it used to be with Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. Now it's going to be with Issa Rae, of course, no stranger to HBO with uh, Insecure. And then another one on HBO Max, J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves uh, from the Batman animated series are reteaming for a new Batman animated series. Um, it's called Batman Caped Crusader. And uh, it's going to be from both HBO Max and Cartoon Network, both owned by 
uh, Warner Brothers, and uh, it is billed as a reimagining of the Batman mythology, and they're uh, teaming up for that with DC Animated Universe veteran Bruce Timm. And then uh, Adult Swim has some spinoffs in the pipeline. Rick and Morty, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, Robot Chicken, and Pretty Face is Going to Hell all have 10-episode uh, mini spinoffs. They're going to be like, I assume, those 15-minute little programming blocks Adult Swim does. And then uh, finally, we know a lot more now about Kevin Smith's He-Man. A lot of sort of uh, more genre stuff today in the reboots. But uh, He-Man is going to follow uh, immediately with the originals episode. So I think that ran like 84 to 86 or something. This is going to follow that timeline immediately. It's only going to be five episodes, um, but there is a star-studded cast here. Mark Hamill is going to play Skeletor. He's, of course, a great voice actor from uh, his Batman stuff, but obviously Star Wars, so fits right in, I think, with, with the He-Man demographic. Uh, Lena Headley is going to be there as well as Eva Lynn, and you're also going to have Sarah Michelle Gellar, Liam Cunningham, Stephen Root, Alicia Silverstone, Henry Rollins, and of course, because Kevin Smith is involved, Jason Mewes is uh, going to be one of the voices as well. So I think that premieres in July, if I'm not mistaken, so we can look forward to that coming up soon. All right, so let's get into the uh, the reviews for this week. I've, I've sort of chatted a lot about news. I knew it was going to be a news-heavy week, but uh, let's get into the reviews. And we're going to start, since we're already talking about He-Man and Batman and all these classic animated characters, we're going to start with the new Marvel series on Hulu. This is uh, not what I would call a classic character at all. It's one much like Guardians of the Galaxy or Ant-Man. I had never heard of MODOK uh, until this series came out, but uh, it's from the creators of Robot Chicken, which means, um, you know, they're, they, there's some Seth Green uh, influence here. He's one of the executive producers. But this is really kind of Patton Oswalt's brainchild. And he voices the lead character, George Tarleton or Modoc, um, and uh, other, other voices here, Ben Schwartz from uh, Parks and Rec. We've got Melissa Fumero from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Wendy McLeod and Covey from uh, The Goldbergs. Beck Bennett from SNL. So, you know, a lot of fairly big names here. We've got John Hamm doing uh, an Iron Man impression uh, as it is, you know, taking place in the Marvel Universe. And uh, all episodes are up now on Hulu. They don't always put every episode up right away, but uh, for this one, they are 10 episodes up immediately. And this is uh, for sure an adult animated show. It's got some language to it. It's got some... Uh, a little bit of sex to it, I suppose, um, from the episodes I saw. But essentially, it is uh, a sitcom um, in certain ways. You know, it's got a lot of those similar tropes, but in the Marvel Universe. So essentially, he has spent years and years as MODOK character um, trying to, to take over the world and battling all the superheroes. Uh, Tony Stark slash Iron Man is actually one of his big nemeses. Um, and so he, he was removed from his company AIM after it falls into bankruptcy and is sold to uh, a rival called Grumble, and uh, Beck Bennett plays the head of that. Um, and at the same time, his wife wants to divorce him. He's dealing with sort of a midlife crisis in that regard. So um, this show actually is very funny. I enjoyed watching it a lot. I think uh, Pat Oswalt's brand of humor is perfect for this show. So is Seth Green's, for that matter. Um, and I, as far as I know, Oswalt has written some of the comic books as well, or at least provided storylines for them or something. So he's sort of all in on this character, and you can kind of tell that from uh, the presentation. He's very funny in the role, um, but because it's from the Robot Chicken people, it is uh, a, a stop-motion animation type of show. Um, not quite as, as sort of herky-jerky as Robot Chicken was back in the day, but um, but you can tell it's, it's definitely, you know, stop-motion more more than a lot of other shows but um what's interesting about it is that the 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 humor this sort of very quick rapid fire jokes and all that kind of stuff i'm not sure how well it fits in the sitcom universe obviously that stuff is great for the robot chicken sketches that they do in the skits um but i think we don't get a strong sense of a lot of these characters because they're reduced to more you know, one-liners or, you know, oh, Modoc is evil, so he's going to, you know, kill this this dog or whatever. And and they, there is a lot of, like, this sort of questionable material um, here in, in that sort of vein. But whatever, you know, it's it's for adults. It's 
not uh, a kids Marvel show. And it is funny, you know, a lot of the the jokes I think are going to go over kids' heads anyway because it's right in that sort of wheelhouse uh, that Oswald and Seth Green sort of grew up in. So there's a lot of like 90s nostalgia type jokes. Um, Third Eye Blind actually gets a whole sort of uh, subplot in episode, I think it's two. Um, so, all right, you know, that's fine. So I think the jokes are sort of going to be pretty niche, much like a lot of the, you know, Robot Chicken or Family Guy type jokes. All, all the Seth Green projects really um, have sort of that edge to them. I am kind of their age, though, so for me, like, it's perfectly in my wheelhouse. But, uh, you know, how will your normal Marvel fan think of it? I I'm not actually sure. You know, but I think there's good voice work here. There's there's fun, uh, you know, involved, and everybody seems to be having a great time with, with their characters. Um, I just am not positive about the melding of the, the sitcom universe with the more rapid-fire sketch-type jokes that we see from Robot Chicken. But overall, I did really enjoy this. I, I, I laughed out loud uh, in both the episodes several times. Um, so I, I'm going to leave MODOK with a B+. Up next, we go over to Netflix for Halston. This is a new mini series, and uh, I was about fifteen minutes through the first episode, and I and I thought, you know, this has got to be Ryan Murphy. Like it was, it was like, look, you know, I'm, I'm a gay man, but it's like Ryan Murphy has this like sort of gay vibe that you can sort of see a mile away because everything's sort of campy and theatrical and overly uh, gay and, and stuff like that. And right away, I was like, this has got to be Ryan Murphy. I probably made it through about 12 minutes before I said that. And sure enough, he is uh, one of the executive producers here. This is part of the Ryan Murphy deal with Netflix. And it makes sense because, you know, uh, Halston, this famous designer, you know, was gay. Ewan McGregor portrays him here. And so that makes sense. But you also have, you know, uh, someone doing Liza Minnelli, Krista Rodriguez, who, by the way, does not do a great Liza. I have to say that. Um, but we see, uh, Joel Schumacher, the director here, sort of in his early years, I guess he was friends with this dude, and Rory Culkin plays him, um, but yeah, this is, of all the recent Ryan Murphy productions, this one, I think, is my least favorite. I haven't given any of them, like, super, super amazing grades, like, I, don't, I think the highest maybe is, like, a B or a B plus, but it's like, you know, the Nurse Ratchet show was, was pretty solid, Hollywood was pretty decent, um, but this sort of falls flat in, in a few different aspects. And each episode uh, at least was co-written by Ryan Murphy. So he really does have his hands in this. Uh, and they were all directed by the same dude, Daniel uh, Minahan. There's only five episodes. Uh, but because there's only five episodes, A, we don't get to quite explore this character uh, as well as I think he may be deserving of. Because... Each episode sort of takes a different uh, event or moment in his life and builds off of that. And then the whole storyline is, you know, okay, well, here we're in 1961. Oh, well, now we're in 1970, whatever. And now we're in 1980, whatever. And it's like, but but we don't even figure out the whole year. We just are focused on each installment, um, you know, uh, of the event. And and I think it, it does a disservice. I think it brings us, it brings this character, Halston, uh to not quite caricature but just um kind of bare bones like we don't really know anything about him other than he is a designer he's gay that's about it you know and it's like and and come on Ryan Murphy we we, we need more than that like I think we've explored some of these other characters in, in your other shows so much deeper I mean you know look at uh, the the feud show the Betty and Joan feud that was what eight or ten episodes about one moment you know here Every moment's whittled down to this, you know, 48 minutes or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's the classic Ryan Murphy sort of filler stuff. It's a lot of sex. It's a lot of fashion. It's a lot of, you know, over-the-top gayness. Uh, and, and it's fine, you know, but uh, I don't think it serves this character well. Uh, I, I really don't. Ewan McGregor is doing a great job uh, in the lead role, though. I will give him that. Um, but this either needed to be... 10 episodes instead of five so we can flesh out some of these things or it needed to be something that wasn't just so uh piecemeal in terms of here's an event this is what happened this is the impression we're doing oh this episode it's joel schumacher this episode it's liza this episode it's you know this person 
it, it's it's just very very cliff notesy, and uh, I, I I expect some camp, some theatrics from Ryan Murphy, but I expect some characterization too. Even a show like Scream Queens that he that he had on Fox. Now, granted, that was you know a full season, so it was like eighteen episodes or something. But you know they they were kind of silly girls and whatever. But we got to learn a lot about them you know, through, through the seasons. And it's weird to me that this is only five episodes because we learn very little about these characters. So I leave Halston with a C minus. Uh, up next, we're going to talk about Solos. This is over on Amazon Prime Video. This is uh, one of the more intriguing entries uh, so far in 2021. This obviously was sort of born out of necessity of COVID and we can't have big crews and big sets and this and that. So uh, each each episode of this anthology series is uh, a a one act basically solo show. So I watched three of these. Uh, episode one was um, Anne Hathaway, uh, directed by Zach Braff, actually, which is kind of odd. But um, then episode two, we had um, sort of doing uh, a, a double. He was sort of playing his own. DNA clone, basically, Anthony Mackie. And then in episode three, we have Helen Mirren, who is uh, an, an older woman uh, that was a part of this, wanted to be a part of the space program. So they're basically sending her into space to never return. Um, and so it's it's her sort of talking to the computer. That one at least had a different voice involved because the computer did talk back to her. But on screen, it was only Ms. Mirren. So, um, it, you know, look, it's an interesting concept. I can't deny that, uh, and, and I think they all come together at the end. I think, I, I didn't read too much into this because I try not to spoil myself, but I, I did read something that after the, like at the end of the seventh episode or something, something kind of connects all of the stories together. So, all right, maybe there is some something like that, but um, these anthology series are hard, you know, um, obviously... I try to watch a few of them to sort of get a feel for the, the style and the tone because one could be real lousy and then the other one could be amazing. But if you watch three, you can kind of gauge, you know, an average of, of what these are like. And um, the, the truth of the matter is I think they're too long. I think uh, with the subject matter that they've chosen and with the um, the, the theme of, of just them doing a monologue a soliloquy whatever um i think a half hour is too long for this series i think for each of these actors it's a great challenge for them it's oh let me see if i can pull this off for a half hour doing you know nothing but you know monologuing um and so i think it acts better as an experiment than it does a show now I wasn't necessarily bored, I guess, in any of them, but I was sort of thinking, is is this all there is? Like, there, you know, and the Anna Hathaway one, I think, had a lot more going on because she plays uh, herself from three different timelines. She invented a time machine, and so she has herself on video screens from different timelines. That was, you know, interesting. And Anthony Mackie had the DNA twin, so they, he was sort of playing off himself as well. But it's still just that person and you know, their, their one act, basically. Um, I think if I went to see this on a stage and it was in person, maybe I would feel differently about it. Maybe it would be a little more thrilling. Um, but because of, I assume COVID restrictions and stuff, you know, the sets are kind of bare bones. They're, they're, they all take place in one room the whole time. So there's not much interesting to look at, you know, in the background. Um, so it really depends on how strong are the stories and they're, good um but are they great are they good enough for a half hour um I, I, i'm not so sure so interesting experiment not sure how the payoff went but look we've seen a lot of uh, less interesting shows come out of the covid uh thing and and i just saw abc's bringing back that uh, horrible luke wilson emergency call show where he just you know, people are reenacting the 911 calls, <laughs> which I think I gave an F to. It was horrible. Maybe maybe a D, but it was bad. So they're bringing that back. So that's much worse than this. Uh, I'm going to leave Solos with a B-. minus. I think it works more as a, as a project or an experiment than it does a show. All right. So next, we're going to go to Pride. This is on FX. It's a uh, six-episode 
mini series, uh, docu series about um, gay pride, uh, specifically in activism. And each episode centers around a different decade. We start in the 50s, and then episode six is in the 2000s. Um, and I, I think this is an interesting show, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if, if you're not a, a regular viewer of Damn Reviews It, you know, I, I'm a gay dude, so this kind of stuff does appeal to me, certainly on a personal level. Um, and there were a lot of, I watched the first two episodes here, and there were uh, quite a few stories that I did not know about. Um, and it, it originally aired, by the way, on FX, but uh, it ended last week, so you can see it on Hulu now. It's 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 wrapped up, um, so you can watch all the episodes on Hulu. But um, they did something in the first episode that I don't love, and I've mentioned this on a few different reviews, um, mm -hmm. where it's a documentary, but the people involved aren't here anymore. They've they've passed on, so they have people portray them, and uh, Aaliyah Shawkat portrays one of them in the, the first episode. And I just, I always have mixed feelings about that because, you know, we don't know what took place. We don't know what was really said, um, you know, so it's helpful to have the person there. And uh, in the in the 50s, there's a few people that are still with us that they do interview and they're, they're in their 70s and 80s now, but they do get interviewed. And it's pretty interesting. And then when we move into the 60s, a lot more people are still with us, so they, they, we get, you know, some, some more specifics. Um, you know, it, it feels a little um, more educational than than entertaining. Um, you know, I, I think a, a good docuseries kind of gives us the best of both, you know. And then you have Tiger King, which is zero information and all entertaining, right? So there's sort of a, a mix at play here that we want to do, but... Um, I learned some interesting things for sure. I think this is a nice way to kind of kick off Pride Month. Um, if you're, you know, maybe a, an ally and you're like, well, you know, I, I'm sort of curious about the history of, you know, Stonewall and, and eight other things that maybe I'm not familiar with. Um, I, I think this is a good education and a good template. Um, the interviews are, are interesting, uh, hearing from some of these people who were there um, but I, I don't really like that whole reenactment thing. I, I wish, you know, they would have maybe talked to people that knew these people or, or maybe, you know, if they had children or sisters or brothers or whatever who are still alive, maybe they could have spoken to it. Maybe there is no one. Um, but I, I feel like in, in each, uh, you know, decade, there there's still people, we're not going back, you know, too, too far. You know, my, I mean, my parents were kids, but they were alive in the 50s, you know. Um, and they're in their early 70s now. So, uh, you know, I, I would have preferred to hear from the specific people rather than doing the reenactments. But I think it is educational. Uh, I think to kick off Pride Month, it's it's a great idea to, to kind of really sink your teeth into. So I'll, I'll give Pride a B plus. Uh, so we close with another sort of gay themed project, um, but also maybe uh, a, a black themed project as well, because it's called pause with Sam J. And I, I was not super familiar with this person. I had sort of heard the name before. And I think that's because she's a writer on SNL. Um, I, I think she's still on SNL actually, but, um, she uh, has her own late night show on HBO max. And what is interesting about this is the fact that they're calling it a late night show. Because um, it's it's a little bit of interview, but it's more interview like Red Table Talk, where it's not like, you know, Sam J is not doing a, a monologue and she doesn't have a desk and, you know, she doesn't have famous people as guests. It's just kind of her sitting around uh, talking to specific people, you know, in the first episode, um, they're, they're talking about a specific term for uh, uh black people and it's not the n-word but it's something I, I still don't think i can say but they say it a lot in the episode um but they're sort of talking about the origins of that and um you know how we got from from there to here and is that term still used and what does it mean today compared to what it used to mean and this and that and the other thing and i thought there were some interesting things they had she had a black republican on uh and they talked a lot about you know that and, and what it is to be black in the republican you know uh community because obviously there's not too many 
Um, and I, so I thought some of the conversations were interesting, but I just, I don't understand why this is specifically called a late night show because it's on HBO Max. It's not like it's on TV at a certain time. Like it just goes up on HBO Max like any other show. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure about that moniker for it. Um, I, I'm not necessarily going to give it lesser of a grade because of that, but I just think it's sort of odd they're calling it a late night show because I didn't get that vibe at all. If anything, it's almost more of a, of a, a variety show because she did a skit for like eight minutes or something towards the end, um, you know, about like the, the, the Black Bill of Rights and stuff. Um, and that part obviously was scripted. Some of the other stuff maybe was not, um, but maybe some of it was, I don't really know. But the conversational stuff did not seem scripted. But then there's parts where she's just like hanging in her apartment quote unquote. She, she said in an interview that it's not actually her apartment because she didn't want it to be trashed, but it's just, you know, her and her friends sitting around drinking and kind of having conversations. And so there's different parts to it, but it seems to me more like a variety show than a quote unquote late night series. But uh, any, in any event, uh, it wasn't necessarily all that funny, but I did like the interesting conversations uh, th that came out of it. So as a conversation piece, I liked it. As a comedy show, I was left a, a bit cooler on it. Um, so I'm going to leave uh, pause with Sam J with a B. Um, so that will do it. Uh, we have a bunch more shows coming out. I think the networks are going to be starting to roll out their summer shows. I know America's Got Talent starts in a couple of days. So I think we'll see more of these new summer shows on the broadcast nets pretty soon. We've been doing, I think this is the second week in a row where it's been all streaming stuff. Um, but yeah, other than that, we'll have uh, more news, of course, next week as well. So thank you for watching, and we'll see you back here next time. Bye.